right to dance and what's the back on?
very special guest tonight, uh, Monty Henderson from Ball Aerospace. I happen to excited and proud to work for the same company. Didn't get to work with Monty on that program, but uh, that, actually that, that uh, hit the, the comment exactly one week before I started at Ball. Oh, is that right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, um, fun company to work for. I see a bunch of folks that I work with here. I'm not going to talk about Bonnie. Bonnie was the uh, program manager for Deep Impact. He's got a lot to talk about what the original mission was, maybe a little bit about what it's still doing because it is still up there and doing good science as well, too. So without further ado, Bonnie, have at it. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much for having me here tonight. Uh, as Mark said, my name is Monty Henderson. I was the program manager for a, a mission called Deep Impact at Ball Aerospace in Boulder, Colorado. Um, and I've given presentations like this for several years now, uh, but in terms of knowledgeable audiences, this is certainly what I would call an expert audience. And I'm quite intimidated by the, the group here. This is a sharp group. I had dinner with the, the board here tonight, um, and they're extremely knowledgeable. And I you know, mentioned, said, hey, you, know, you guys are a little you're making me nervous. You, you're so smart on the astronomy. I am an engineer. I was a program manager. Please be gentle with me. <laughs> and Tom said, don't worry about it. You're only entertaining us until the sun is down and it's dark. <laughs> 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 the only time the sun goes down. So I am here just to wait till it gets dark, and then people will start drifting off up to the observatory. So thank you very much for having me. I appreciate all of you coming out. Um, I've got a lot of things to talk about. I talk for a good 45, 50 minutes. Um, we can do questions afterwards, but if you have a question in the middle, don't hesitate to raise your hand. And certainly you guys, if any of you want to talk to me afterwards about anything that you saw in the presentation that you want more information about, I would be glad to sit with you all night if necessary, okay? All right. Okay, so. I have in this first in my presentation here a lot of footage from a deep uh, Discovery Channel uh, documentary that was done on the program. So you'll be seeing some of the footage from the, the documentary. It was called Comet Collision. And I have a few copies up here. If anybody would like a copy, uh, go ahead and pick one up when you leave tonight. And I've got about 10 of them. So let's go ahead and get started. Have more volume, please. Speakers up. No, not the lights. The sound. Some come down the island for over 100 miles in diameter and travel at speeds of 60,000 miles per hour. Sooner or later, one of these monsters will strike Earth. Unless scientists can learn how to deflect or destroy them. But we don't even know what comets are made of. And what we don't know. In 2005, a $330 million bullet was shot into space on a NASA mission called Deep Impact. We're doing something that nobody has done. We have only one chance. It's all or nothing on the first try. The target was the heart of a comet. The goal? To learn at last what its killers are made of. We need to go into space and to the comet to create enormous explosion that excavates this enormous hole. We've been hit by comets and by asteroids. This time we get to take the revenge and we're going to slam into the comet itself. Scientists tell the incredible story of how they smashed a probe into a comet on the 4th of July and why fireworks like these could someday save our planet. We've got images of things that blow our minds away. I haven't had such a gentleman rush since my first date. <laughs> this is exactly what we have built this space to do. Okay, so what did you hear in there? We're doing something that had never been done before. We were going to a comet to determine what comets are made of. There had been some flybys of comets that had taken pictures, but what NASA wanted was what's in the interior of a comet. Ball Aerospace, what can you do for us? 
So the, the final answer here is that on July 4th, 2005, we successfully smashed into Comet Temple 1. It was the largest media event for NASA of an unmanned mission in their history. Hundreds of thousands of people watched as we smashed into the comet on what was July 4th on the East Coast, July 3rd in California where we all more were, and it was NASA's most widely uh, followed unmanned mission ever. And at the heart of that mission was a company in Boulder, Colorado called Ball Aerospace, a company that many of you would recognize from the canning jars. <laughs> Ball, Ball Jars is the founding product of our corporation. And we have built many, many satellites, but we had never, ever built a spacecraft that left the Earth orbit. This was our first deep space mission that was later called one of NASA's most challenging ever. Questions? When we hit that comet, everybody was excited, but the big question that came up over and over again at that time and now when I give this presentation is, why? <laughs> why did we go out and smash into a comet? That's what I'm here for. So the presentation today, we'll talk about comets and their secrets. What did we want to learn about comets? And you'll find out that before we started this mission, we knew almost nothing about comets. The spacecraft, what did we design and build? This is kind of the heart of my presentation. I'm an engineer. We built this spacecraft. I'm quite proud of it. There's several employees in here. Raise your hand who helped me on this. Yes, it's good to see you guys. Um, we're very proud of our spacecraft. And then the mission. What did we actually do with this spacecraft that we built? OK, comets and their secrets. Why do we want to learn more about comets? The short answer is because we don't really know anything about comets before the start of this mission. What we knew was very simple. Comets have a nucleus. <coughs> Out in deep space, it's a black charcoal briquette, invisible to any of our obser observatories, space-based or ground-based. You can't see it. If some of them live in the Oort Kellogg, some most of them come from the Kuiper Belt, they are orbiting our sun at various periods. When it gets closer in around the Mars orbit, it starts to warm up at the sun. The sun <coughs> heats up the nucleus, and that starts to, oh, I'm hitting the wrong button. <coughs> that starts to form a coma. As that comet comes in closer to the sun, the water that is encapsulated in the ice that's in that comet sublimates, which means it immediately goes from ice to gas and creates a coma. So now you can no longer see the nucleus because the water vapor is coming off of the comet, creating a coma that then results in the dust tail because part of the ice embedded in the ice is dirt. And or, uh, astronomers tend to call comets dirty snowballs. Lots of ice with rock and material in there with the ice. And as that ice sublimates off, that material is thrown out into space, creating the dust tail. And that dust is highly reflective, so you get to see that the dust reflecting the sunlight from the ground. So you can see this is hundreds of millions of miles long, okay? Then there's the ion tail. So the ion tail is when the gases are released, the sun ionizes that gas and turns into the ion tail. And so that gas then grows, glows, grows, glows like a fluorescent bulb. So they get two separate tails coming off of that comet based on the material that is released from that heating of the comet. Now, scientists believe that the comets were formed four and a half billion years ago at the formation of our solar system. So they are the oldest, this is scientific hypothesis, they are the oldest, most primitive bodies in the solar system. And in the nucleus of that comet is the pristine material that existed when our solar system was formed. So they're a time capsule. Okay, that's why NASA wants to go in and excavate a hole in a comet 
to get out, get through that icy shell and go find out what the material was that existed when our solar system was formed. Okay, why? Hypothesis is that it may have brought the volatile light elements, the carbons, the hydrogens, the nitrogens, the oxygens, that may have helped the Earth develop its atmosphere. Okay, that's pretty heady stuff. Did a comet bring the material that created an atmosphere that allowed Earth to support life? And then, once the Earth had an atmosphere, did a comet collision on Earth bring the carbons, the nitrogens, and were carbon-based life forms? Is that what started the life process here on Earth? That's why this was such an exciting mission for us. It's an amazing thing to think about. Is that where we came from? There also is the other side of what comets can do for us, or to us. Um, off the Yucatan Peninsula, about 65 million years ago, a comet, asteroid, something smashed into the Yucatan Peninsula that we believe clouded out the sky, darkened the sun, and caused the extinction of the dinosaurs. Okay, do comets bring life? Do comets take life away? There's a lot of information contained inside that uh, frozen, dirty snowball. Okay. So our mission, NASA said, we want Ball Aerospace to find a way to excavate material out of a comet. Now, scientifically, this is the scientific process. We are replicating a naturally occurring phenomena in a controlled environment so we can observe the results. Okay? This is a mosaic of mercury. You can see it is pocked marked like a teenager. Okay? <laughs> Mercury doesn't have an atmosphere, so any celestial body that is going into Mercury doesn't burn up in its atmosphere, so it goes right in and creates a nice big crater. And because it doesn't have an atmosphere, there's no wind, there's no rain, and that crater persists in its pristine condition forever. So you can see all over Mercury's face, it gets hit a lot. So what we were doing was going out to Comet Temple 1 to recreate an impact and watch it. Okay, so what did we want to learn from this? What were we trying to achieve? What were the results that we were going to consider a success? All right, what are the basic properties of the comet? The strength, the density, and the structure. Okay, it's a dirty snowball. But is it a really hard packed icy snowball that's going to hurt when it hits you? Or is it more of a fluffy, cottony snowball that we're going to punch right through when we hit it? We don't know the structure. We don't know the density. How does a comet evolve? Does it exhaust all its gases? So when it's coming in and we're not seeing outgassing, does that mean it's out of gas? Or does it mean that the outer layer of ice has sealed all of the gases to the interior, into the nucleus of the comet. And by punching a hole through that ice, are we going to see a 4th of July type explosion of outgassing from the breakout of the shell? And then the primary goal, what are the elements inside the comet nucleus? What's contained inside that shell? And what is the material that's in there? OK, now this was really not one of our primary goals. How could we alter the course of a comet that was coming towards Earth? This became a little more visible, a little bit bigger of a goal when the media got a hold of it. So the media started talking about, well, you know, are you going to be able to divert the comet? All right, we're not going to divert the comet. This is a challenge to get to the comet and observe an extraction of material. But the media really latched onto this part of it, as you saw in that Discovery Channel. So we, we still talked about it. Getting to the comet, hitting it is one challenge. Hitting it with something big enough to actually divert it in a different direction, an incredible challenge. No answer to that right now. So that was not part of our goal. But once the media got a hold of it, we had to talk about it an awful lot. 
OK, so Comet Temple 1. Why did we choose Comet Temple 1? It was discovered back in 1867 by Ernest Temple. It comes through our solar system, or around Earth, every five and a half years. So as comets go, we actually knew a fair amount about it. We, we knew its period. We knew when it was coming. Okay? We could have gone after Comet Halley. Uh, it comes around every 76 years, and it came by 30 years ago, right? So we didn't really want to wait another 46 years for it to come by. We thought it might be a little antique by the time. Our hardware might be a little antique by the time it came through. We thought we wouldn't wait 17,000 years for Hayakutake to come through. <laughs> so the, the candidate list got pretty short when we started looking for, OK, how long is it going to take us to build our spacecraft? And when we finish that, what's the comet that's going to come through? So the timing was great. Comet Temple 1 was coming through at the right time. We knew enough about it to predict where it was coming. And that was our proposed mission. Okay. Um, Another interesting thing with, uh, that I learned with the media, um, this got a lot of good media coverage, 2003, 2004, 2005. And I would sit down with reporters for 45 minutes at a time, giving them my best wisdom, thinking I was just being really, really smart. And then I would make some comment about, oh yeah, and the comment is avocado shaped, or pickle shaped, or cucumber shaped, or you know, it's this, and that's what they always printed. So I had to be very, very careful. Um, this was the first program I'd ever managed, and it was by far the most visible program that Ball had done other than the, the uh, saving of the Hubble Space Telescope that we did uh, 10 years earlier. And I was not media savvy when I started, but I learned very quickly that from the kidding from my coworkers that I had to watch what I said. <laughs> Another important aspect of uh, Comet Temple 1 is it rotates on its axis very slowly, okay? Which is important because we wanted to watch the crater formation. So after we had created the impact that would excavate the material, we didn't want it spinning out of our field of view really quick. So it was a nice slow rotator so we would get a lot of time to actually image the impact after the crater. Would you pick up my leg? Oh, here it is over here, okay, thanks. Because I will step on it and break my ankle. Thank you. solar pressure and the solar wind pushes the ion tail and the uh, dust tail directly away from the sun in any direction that the comet is in. I prefer questions to be, what color is it? <laughs> How much does it weigh? <laughs> okay. The plan calls for a spacecraft to perform a cosmic biopsy by firing a high-tech projectile into the heart of the comet. So in 1999, NASA began a project called Deep Impact, a preemptive attack on a comet to finally see what the monsters were made of. We've been hit by comets and by asteroids. This time, we get paid revenge, and we're going to slam into the comet itself. Dr. Schultz joined a team of astronomers, astrophysicists, and engineers assembled by NASA. Their mission began in a conference room and would hopefully end six years later on the surface of a comet. But we gotta get that schedule laid out. I think I'm gonna be here. The deep impact spacecraft will travel at a cruising speed of 64,000 miles per hour for approximately 170 days. Onboard computers will update scientists each step of the way, with the craft's position relative to the Earth, the Sun, and the stars. The goal is to intercept a comet moving through space and launch a probe called an impactor directly into the comet's path. The collision should generate a mountain of data, providing clues to the secret ingredients of comets. Assuming, of course, that the navigational systems put a ship in optimal position for the big shot. We've had flyby comets before, at least those missions are difficult. Space. Program managers 
scientists Monty Henderson and John Marriott begin the arduous journey from scientific concept to actual construction of a complex spacecraft. Well, you'll notice that my hair looks a little different in this picture than the years ago. <laughs> That's what deep space missions will do to a guy. <laughs> okay, so the spacecraft. A company whose products have never left Earth's orbit, selected to build a spacecraft for one of NASA's most challenging missions. What did we design and build? Let's talk about the spacecraft. Okay, when you launch, on a rocket, we launched on a Delta II, a Boeing Delta II. You attach to the third stage of the rocket on the payload attachment fixture with a launch adapter ring. So this, this was our link to the booster rocket. Okay. Now the way we accomplished deep impact was we built two spacecraft. One that was called an impactor spacecraft. This is the international symbol for impactor spacecraft. <laughs> It was a very smart spacecraft. It could navigate itself into the comet. It had a propulsion system. It had a star tracking system. It had a camera. So it navigated itself into Comet Temple 1. We also built a flyby spacecraft. The flyby spacecraft carried, like a Russian stacking doll, the impactor spacecraft for six months minus 24 hours took it out to the path of the comet and released it in front of the comet. So we'll, we'll talk about the components that go into those two spacecraft. But the important thing to remember is impactor and flyby are two entirely separate, fully autonomous spacecraft. They control themselves. I think NASA got a real bargain on this. Okay, so we're building up the impactor spacecraft here. And you can see this is a star tracker. We'll talk about star trackers a little bit. This is the telescope, the guidance system. So it looks straight down out of the uh, uh, impactor. The comet in this orientation would come straight out of the floor and smash us into here. Uh, it has its own CPU. It has its own telemetry system. It is a fully functioning spacecraft. Okay, on top of here, S-band antenna, a patch, antenna that communicates directly to the flyby spacecraft to receive commands and send telemetry back. So it does communicate with the flyby just to tell the flyby what it's doing and to take the images that it's or gathering and send it off to the flyby for telemetry and down to the ground. All right, so now we're going to build the flyby spacecraft. So this is the propulsion deck. Most NASA missions have some sort of propulsion. This was a blow-down hydrazine system, 90 kilograms of hydrazine in the tank. Hydrazine is extremely poisonous. Uh, we couldn't do any testing with hydrazine until we, oh, we didn't do any testing with hydrazine, and we didn't even see the hydrazine until we were actually out in Florida getting ready to launch. So we ran the system uh, dry and with alcohol to check it out. But it's a, a propulsion system. But propulsion, it's a gas tank. Eventually, you're going to run out of gas. So you're very judicious with when you actually use your propulsion on this type of mission because you don't want to run out of gas because there's no filling station in space to fill back up. So we, we planned our burns very, very meticulously. Okay, now we're going to build up the, the frame of the, the, the flyby. You see two of everything. This is what's known as a redundant system. NASA doesn't like failures. So they want you to have redundancy on everything on the spacecraft. So if you put one computer on, you have to have a backup. So if this one fails, you switch to your backup. So every box has a backup box on it. This is the instrument control electronic, controls the uh, uh, telescopes, the batteries, the interface unit that communicates, that allows us to communicate to the ground and to this spacecraft. Momentum wheels that allow us to do some positioning. We'll talk about those in a little bit. Um, and these are the, the two computers, uh, the processors themselves, we'll also talk about in a little bit. Now, any of you that have seen satellites, typically you will see the hardware on the outside of the satellite. Makes it really easy to work on it when it's in the clean room and you're installing it. The problem with deep impact 
is we're flying into a comet. Okay? The flyby is not going to actually hit the comet, but it's going to fly through the debris field of the comet, the tail. So we had to shield our spacecraft from debris. So we put all of our components on the inside and using these panels as a line of defense against catastrophic hit from the particles from the comet. All right? Now we put on the instrument platform. We had two telescopes on the flyby spacecraft, a telephoto lens, very, very high resolution, <coughs> tight field of view, had a visual uh, camera and an infrared camera. And as NASA will tell you, the visual pictures are what get the, ex the communities excited, but the infrared camera with spectrometry, spectroscopy, is what really gets the scientists excited. And we'll talk about what you get out of spectroscopy. And it's not a sexy picture, but it tells you everything about what the, the material composition is. We had a wide angle telescope. This telescope and the telescope that's in the impactor are the same two telescopes, same format. This one actually had a filter wheel so we could kick through filters. But this gives us a nice wide field of view. And this zeroes in on the impact, si impact point of the, uh, uh, on the comet itself. Star trackers, okay? The GPS doesn't work outside of Earth orbit. So we do what the old time sailors did. We use the stars to tell us where we're going. Okay, it's the same triangulation that they used when Magellan was sailing. It's just now computer controlled and there's a real nice star catalog in here that we use to tell ourselves where we are in space. All right, high gain antenna, the big dish on top. This is how we communicate back to the ground. We're traveling over 400 million miles in a path orbiting around the Earth, and ultimately we'll be 85, 88 million miles away from Earth. We have to be able to send the image data that we collect back to the ground quickly before this spacecraft flies through the tail of the comet because it might be destroyed. So we have a high gain antenna that sends back high rate data. We have a gimbal that points from 80 some million miles away with a quarter of degree accuracy. We paid a million dollars for that gimbal. The company who built it spent more than two making it. And so <laughs> fixed price contracts can be very dangerous in NASA world. Uh, and they were made by a company here uh, in North Boulder called Starsis. Uh, they did a fantastic job. It was a fixed price contract and they lost a lot of money on it. Uh, these are the solar panels. Every mission has solar panels. That's how you keep your battery charged, okay? There is no generator on board other than a battery. And all total, this entire spacecraft ran about 1,100 watts, less than your hairdryer, okay? Very, very efficient spacecraft because we don't have capacity to launch big, heavy batteries. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. He's, he's <laughs> leaving. That's great, man. Yeah. Yeah. I know where you live. <laughs> okay, there, this was identified as either a wash tub or a washing machine. That's the size. And this was at the time I drove a Ford Explorer. So it was about the size of a Ford Explorer. <laughs> and you can find uh, daily camera articles that use those exact quotes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and this is the uh, S-band antenna that communicates with the impactor. Okay, so now we put the impactor up inside. Okay, we just made it up inside the flyby and that's our launch configuration. It's nestled up inside, it's protected for its flight out to the comet. Okay, this is what it looks like inside after you button up the side. You can see the tolerances are pretty tight to get all of the boxes in. And then you'll see on the next picture, the hydrogen tank goes in here. So we have very tight tolerances all the way around. Aaron, would you be able to come up here? Now I want to talk a little bit about these guys. This is, these are the reaction wheels, okay? We, we talked about propulsion and how propulsion is a consumable. 
you can run out of gas if you're not really clever with the way you fly your spacecraft. So in order to position the spacecraft and not have to use fuel, we use what are known as reaction wheels. They're heavy gyros. And this allows us to move our spacecraft around without using any fuel. Now typically I would have a, a spinning chair on here. This is my big reaction wheel. Grab it by the axle. Okay? Yeah. Hold on tight, keep it off your chest. You guys should try this at home. I don't say that for a lot of things, but try this at home. <laughs> okay, now, he's got a spinning gyroscope in his hand. Turn it to the right. Okay, what do you feel? Well, I basically feel the uh, pressure um, kind of pushing down on my right hand, and I guess that's pretty much it. Yeah, if you were on a spinning chair, you'd be spinning around. Okay, now if you turn it back the other way, it's hard to turn it, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, you're fighting against the rotation which this is how we position our spacecraft. We use the momentum of the reaction wheels, and the swivel chair, if we had it, would be moving him around, and as he shifted the spinning of that wheel, it would spin him in various directions. So we've got three plus a spare. So by spinning them in conjunction with each other, it allows us to move the spacecraft. Thanks, Aaron, I appreciate you coming up. Yeah, yeah Aaron. Another challenge of space, you might notice a big blank spot right here. This is our primary computer. This is our backup computer. Okay. The, the processor inside our computer was a Motorola Power, Power PC architecture. About the revision that was in the Macintosh Power Mac in 1994. Okay. Now we launched in 2004. So we were launching with 10 year old technology. But Here's the challenge you have when you're sending something into space. We went to Motorola and said, well, NASA went, ball game. NASA went to Motorola and said, we'd like your best chip, the most current one that give us the highest power processing power that's available on the market now. And Motorola said, yeah, it's our power PC coming out. Here you go. We said, OK, Motorola, we want to fly this in space. So we need you to space qualify. We need you to put it through thermal vacuum testing. We need to make sure that it'll work at launch temperatures or launch vibrations, space temperatures of plus or minus 200 degrees um, C. So you've got to freeze it, you've got to bake it, you've got to justify that this thing and prove to us that it will survive deep space environment and we'll fly it out on all of our missions coming up. So if you do that for us, Motorola, we'll buy maybe. <laughs> and at that time, the PowerPC was taking off. They were making about 100,000 chips a month. NASA said, you do all this extra work for us, man, we'll bet you 10. <laughs> so Motorola said, yeah, thanks, but no. Um, so fortunately, Motorola, Intel, they all know this business. They sell their dyes to aerospace corporations who are willing to invest in space hardening their processor. So the chip that Apple was paying eight, 10, $12 for, we were paying $250,000 for <laughs> because it was going to work in space. And a company called BAE, British, British Aerospace, that's actually in America, had gone through all of the, the hoops to prove to NASA that it was space qualified. So we had the best computer processor out in the, in the market for space-based processing, and it was 10 years old, 10-year-old technology. This is the challenge of working in a space environment. Okay. So now we put the hydrazine tank in. It's covered in uh, mylar insulation, and we're starting to button up the spacecraft. Okay, the next challenge. This is our impact. This is Dr. Michael Ahern. This deep impact was his idea. He's a professor at the University of Maryland, excellent man. He was the, the principal investigator. He led the science team. Pleasure to work with. He was quite exceptional. Um, the science team got together and said, OK, Ball Aerospace, we need a bullet. That impactor has got to fly into the, the comet and create a massive debris field out and excavate the biggest crater he can. And they were expecting something the size of 
in Vesco Field Sports Authority Mile High Stadium. They wanted something that big. So they wanted a hemispheric bullet built into the impactor to bring you know, the kinetic energy smashing into the comet. And they said, we don't know what materials are in the comet, but we're reasonably certain that the noble metals won't be there. And if they are there, we know their spectrum well enough that we can extract it out and they don't react quickly. So we can get, take them out of the signature data that we get. So we need you to build as much of the impactor as possible out of a noble metal. Now I know all of you know your noble metals, your periodic tables like the back of your hand. That's gold, silver, or copper. So Ball, being a company that actually tries to make, a money, make money, said, oh, well, maybe we'll choose copper. So we, we made the bullet out of solid copper, and a lot of the, the structural components of the impactor were also made out of copper. OK. So now we have a 220-pound bullet mounted into the impactor, and that's what's going to create. I mean, this is this big. I mean, it, it's smaller than the diameter of this table. And that's going to excavate a crater on Comet Temple 1 the size of Invesco. And we have another challenge. An incredible punch, no matter what the size. A single chunk of the tree of the leading comet is the force of six million megatons. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot to hand out the critical uh, part of this. We'll replay this. OK, I apologize. I meant to hand out the M&Ms at the beginning, but I was so nervous after dinner that I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I'm going to replay that, because there's a critical message in here that these M&Ms play a part to. <laughs> Okay, so while we're fixing them, <coughs> that was good. Okay, so as this is coming back up, we're flying into a debris field. The, the nucleus is ejecting material out into the coma that's contained in the ice. All right, our dirty snowball is melting away and the particles are coming out. But we're sending our impactor into that nucleus. So we're going to see debris. Now, we are coming, that comet is coming at us at 10 kilometers a second, which is 23,000 miles an hour. All right? Debris moving at 23,000 miles an hour can do some pretty significant damage. All right, so get an M&M. &M. Just one. All right, bite it in half. All right, now take that half that you've got and bite that in half again, if you can. So now you've got this little piece of chocolate in your hand. Feel how heavy that is. That's about a quarter of a gram, OK? Quarter of a gram, if you threw that at your neighbor, they wouldn't even notice. <laughs> Try it, I promise. <laughs> but a quarter of a gram at 23,000 miles an hour and I'll pass this around because it's hard to see. Uh, oh, right. Right. Yeah. Well, this, you haven't even heard half of it yet. The wow here is at 23,000 miles an hour, the air hits first. 
because it's building a, a percussion in front that dimples the cop copper, just the air percussion, okay? That quarter of a gram that you've got in your hand, the first layer of copper that it goes through, there's so much force that it creates what essentially looks like an exit wound. Okay, it's pushing the, the, the pressure back out as it goes through this first layer. Okay, so what we did was we put five layers of copper in. The point is not to stop the debris at 23,000 miles an hour. The point is to break it up, to diffuse the energy across multiple areas of the shield, and hopefully slow it down by the time it gets to the last shield. And you'll notice as this comes around that the hole four shields down is softball size. It's finally slowed down enough that it's slowing down and it just creates a big hole and then it's done. But the speed that it's getting to before then, it's just blowing through these shields almost like they're not there, but it's breaking it apart. So this is the type of debris we had to build protection against in our impact. Now we tested this. This is actually a test from the, uh, there's a high speed air gun range that is run by the University of Denver. And so they set this up for us and did some testing so we could determine how many layers of shield shielding would be required in order to stop a quarter of a gram. So if you guys can pass this around, <coughs> take a look at it. I'll start it up here. Sorry. And like the aerogel, is that what you're talking about? Yep. Yeah, and the nice thing about foam is it's very light compared to copper. So yeah, it's it's another advancement. All right. Hold me. Somebody hit next, please. The spacecraft must be ready to take a hit. Hit next, please. Here, let me turn this off and on again and see if that's good. the shielding, so we built that bullet out of copper, and then at each of the layers we put shielding in. The, the comet will be coming this direction, so we want to make sure that all of our electronics are protected as well as possible so we can get an image as we're flying into the comet. Okay? We were able to get a picture of the comet 3.7 seconds before we were smashed and overrun by the comet. So we were able to take an image and get it telemetered out to the flyby spacecraft in 3.7 seconds before we were hit. Okay, put a, put a shell over the uh, impact or it's good to go. The flyby spacecraft. This is a very intense day. Craig, I was trying to decide, are you in this picture somewhere? <coughs> no? Okay. Um, this was the first day First time we mated the two spacecraft together, stacked them in. An incredibly intense day, <coughs> hoping that if we had done all of our tolerances correctly and then they would stack and everything would be fine for the launch. And because it was such an intense day, I figured what the heck, we'd invite the Discovery Channel in to watch it. <laughs> uh, so I'm standing right over here with the Discovery film crew and we're filming, I mean, it took us five hours to move from the stand over here, up, over, and down onto this impact. We finished. Everybody on the team was like, oh, thank goodness it's done. The Discovery Channel is still filming, filming, filming. And finally the producer says, are you guys at least going to clap? <laughs> it was just it was such a relief and there was so much tension <coughs> that nobody wants to celebrate the little milestones because you know there's another challenge coming up. Okay. So now we have assembled and tested the spacecraft, but we have to prove to NASA it'll survive the mission. 
Just like NASA told Motorola, you gotta prove your power PC chip will work in space. Well, aerospace, prove that your spacecraft is gonna work in space. And I'll zip through this part pretty quick. First thing you have to do is you have to find the center of gravity, center of mass on both your spacecraft. So we put it on a spin balancer and spin it and determine the exact position of the center of mass because when we mount it on the third stage, the third stage comes off the booster spinning. And if it's not perfectly balanced on that third stage, you get a wobble and then you get a bad insertion after orbit. So we have to know exactly where the center of mass is. Okay, launching a spacecraft is a violent activity. It shakes the bejeebas out of our spacecraft. So we have to prove to NASA on the real spacecraft that we can shake it to launch loads and nothing will break. When you put a solar panel, and this is bagged in uh, electrostatic bagging so that we don't have any dust or debris or uh, discharge, electric discharge on the spacecraft. This is a ball aerospace here. Um, these are the solar panels. And when you're shaking something that big on a vibration table, it sounds like a drum. And when you're the program manager responsible for this program, a drum coming off of your solar panel is fright frightening to hear. It was uh, a tough day. Survived vibration. All right, we take it into our EMI, EMC chamber. Electromagnetic interference, electromagnetic conductivity, all right? NASA has this silly rule about safety. <laughs> they don't want our spacecraft interfering with their safety operations such that if the booster, the, the Delta vehicle starts to go off track and come back over land, range safety will explode that space, the, uh, the rocket so that it doesn't come back over people and civilization. We have to prove to them that our electronics that will be powered during that time won't interfere with their range safety ability to explode the Delta rocket if necessary. They also want us to prove that our electronics don't hamper each other, being that they're all very close together. They have to be shielded so that one box doesn't interfere with the next. All right, we have to prove that it'll work at space temperatures. Negative 292 degrees Fahrenheit to 266, positive 266 degrees Fahrenheit. This is not survival temperatures for your Macintosh at home, <laughs> all right? And this is in a vacuum. And what happens in a vacuum, all the air is gone. So there's no way to actually cool. You can't blow a fan in a vacuum because there's no air. So you have to have a, a cooling approach, a radiated cooling. We put it inside this big tank cover it up, and for 30 days, we do what is called thermal vacuum testing. And Andrea supported a thermal vac testing at JPL several years ago. It's not the most exciting time. Craig, Darrell, we've all supported them. It's round the clock, 30 days of making it hot, making it cold, <laughs> making it hot, making it cold. And it takes a long time to cycle between that temperature range. 30 days is what NASA requires. Brent. So is the spacecraft essentially like slowed up and running while you're doing it? Are you communicating with it? Yeah, the spacecraft thinks it's flying. So it has to be operational. And, and actually, some of these are survival temp temperatures as well. There's a, there's a range in here that has to be operational, and then it has to survive cold soak and heat bake outside of that, but not operational. OK, another one of my you couldn't believe it stories. Um, NASA requires this thing called an acoustic test, which for companies the size of Boeing's and Lockheed Martin's, it's a big room with this 15 foot diameter subwoofer that blasts their spacecraft with these ultrasonic frequencies, low frequency sounds to simulate the, the vibrations that they will incur at launch, okay? Ball doesn't have that, but Ball knew a company called Maryland Sound who had a lot of cool, cool speakers. So we called Maryland Sound and said, we need to simulate an acoustic chamber out in our high bay. Can you send us a bunch of speakers? Okay, this is the summer of 2004. Holland Oates was on tour <laughs> in our area. So they were on a break. They dismantled the Holland Oates stage set, brought it out to our facility. For four days, we did acoustic testing with our spacecraft surrounded by concert speakers from the Holland Oates concert. They disassembled it, they went back to Holland Oats, we went back to testing, the next phase. So, we, Ball has a reputation for finding ways around doing things the expensive way, and this was an, actually a very cheap way to do an acoustic test. Okay, another Frankenstein test. 
what you're looking at here, yeah, this is called shock test. When we come off of the third stage, we're blown off the third stage by an explosion. Okay? NASA wants us to prove that our computers will survive, operationally survive, being ejected off the third stage from that, the, the bolts exploding and releasing. So we mounted our computers onto a metal plate, got a big heavy lead pipe, set it up in a swing, and for three times, cut a rope that you can't see because it's too thin, that red lead pipe swang down and smashed into the back of this panel, and the computer had to stay operational. We had to prove it would happen three times. Another test that scared the bejesus out of me. That was a heck of a <laughs> wham when it hit. But this isn't the way I would recommend doing it, but it did work. Okay. So now what did we do? Click right in the middle of that black box. Yeah. <coughs> okay. All right. So unfortunately, that's not going to show. Um, this is a. We're out in Florida. Picture if you will. Sure. Let's try. It. And I'll, I'll talk about what we would have been seeing. Um, you go out to Florida, you do your final integration testing in Florida. They come and put a big can around your spacecraft. They cart it over to their launch pad for the Delta facility. They crane it 135 feet up in the air. They move it inside a clean room. So you're 135 feet up in the air. The ocean is spinning distance off to the side. And they build a clean room up there so they can unpack your spacecraft and attach it to their launch vehicle. So there's a clip here of, you know, they, they put one half of the fairing up, then they bring our spacecraft in, in this clean room, so we're all up, you know, 135 feet up in the air in our little bunny suits, making sure that the, the spacecraft installation goes well. We do a, a final yes check that it's alive, they encapsulate us up, and then we're set for launch. Another incredibly challenging period, and Boeing is a nice union shop, they work their hours, and the payload is welcome to work from midnight until 6 a.m. in the morning. So we got to go up after everybody else was done working and make sure that everything had been installed correctly. So we spent a lot of time up on that rocket in a couple of days at 3 a.m. The plan I wish I should have checked to see what slide we were on. So type 31 and hit return. No, keep going. Is this how you pictured it? <laughs> so they're buttoning up inside the fairing. And that was the last time we saw our little spacecraft. Dust covers under the, uh, or that cover the, the lenses of the cameras. There's several things that are called remove before flight items. You check, you double check, you triple check, you quadruple check, then you have somebody else check to make sure that the remove for before flight items actually got removed before you close the fairing. All right, here we go. The countdown to launch ends January 12, 2005. Deep impact now belongs to the launch team. After years of hands-on effort, Managers John Marriott and Monty Henderson can do little more than cross their fingers and savor the moment. This is the, this is the amazing time. I mean, it's hard to it's 
hard to describe. It's, you just stand there and you just admire it. Deep impacts must lift off today at a single predetermined second, or the entire launch will be pushed back. Till the next day. <laughs> A little bit of drama with the Discovery Channel. So we're off. Mission begins. We launched on a Delta II Heavy from Cape Canaveral on January 12, uh, 2005. Okay, and have, as we've discussed a little bit, let's see if that's... Okay. This is Earth. This is the sun. We've just launched. This yellow dot is deep impact. We're going to travel over 400 million miles to get in front of Comet Temple 1, this somewhat smoking comet. <laughs> it doesn't exactly follow the, uh, the, the model. But so <laughs> the, the challenge here is that we don't want to do this. Okay? This comet is traveling at 66,000 miles an hour. Okay? If we're coming at it, then we're trying to hit a bullet with a bullet. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to get out in front of it so our launch date got us to a point where we could get in front of the comet, release the impactor in the flight path of the comet. We're moving at about 44, 45,000 miles an hour, so oh, oh, along the same flight path as the comet. So then the closing speeds are only 23,000 miles an hour, <laughs> okay? So we increased our odds of impact by getting in front of it and essentially trying to run away from it at a slower speed so it would overcome us and smash us. Okay, so on January 12th we launched. We spent 30 days commissioning the spacecraft. Very typical duration. You characterize your spacecraft, you make sure you lined up your thrusters in the right orientation so when you say turn to the left, not that the space has left, uh, it goes left, that your star trackers are uh, appropriate line. 30 days to prove that the spacecraft is working before you really get off and start going. Remember the impactor is still living up inside our flyby spacecraft. It's alive, it's powered, but it's never flown. Okay, preparation for our one shot 24 critical hours on July 3rd, July 4th. On July 3rd, about 10 o'clock in the <coughs> evening, we released the impact. Okay? We have spent 30 days in January and February proving to NASA this <coughs> spacecraft is working correctly. 24 hours after we release the impactor in front of the comet, the comet's going to hit it. So we have to characterize in 24 hours what we took 30 days to do. Huge congratulations to the engineering team, the test team. Everything went incredibly smoothly. We had no major anomalies. 22 hours before impact, we were characterized and settled. The, the red guys are flying the impactor. So 
they're monitoring the impact of telemetry. The blue guys are flying the mission and the flyby. So if you were watching on the night of July 3rd into the 4th, when we hit, we were instructed nobody could react until it was officially announced that we had hit the comet and we got imagery back. But as soon as we hit, all of these guys had nothing to do because they're telemetry now. <laughs> so they all sat back. And you know, it was like, oh, okay. Well, obviously something has happened because all the guys in red shirts are now longer, no longer doing anything. <laughs> 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 and that was a very good sign. Okay. So I'm sitting in front next to the instrument scientists. We're watching this imagery develop. Dana? Let's see if it's coming. This is the comet imagery coming off the impactor as it's coming in. Oh, all right, we're gonna have to just skip it. Um, see if you can click in the middle there. But. So you saw where my seat was, that the camera for NASA was shooting over my head. Okay, because this is the imagery we're getting. Okay, NASA doesn't want this shown before they have control over it. So the camera's shooting over my head to the rest of the team that are flying the mission. Go ahead, hit it back up and hit the camera. Hit it in there again, I'd like to see this. So the instrument scientists and I were looking at the imagery coming up, and every picture that's coming up is better than any comet picture that exists in the NASA archive at the time. Unbelievably exciting. This last picture, 3.7 seconds before it was hit by the comet. So we were very confident that we had hit. <laughs> but we had to sit quietly. So it was a little bit anticlimactic, but we finally got to stand up and cheer. We'd known for several minutes. At 1.52 a.m. Eastern Time on the 4th of July, a journey to the dawn of the solar system ends 83 million miles from Earth. Seconds before the collision, images from the impact reveal a lunar-like surface with craters a mile across. Boom! A spectacular impact is recorded by cameras aboard the rover ship. We've got you know, images of things that uh, blow our minds away. When we first saw this image, it was just pure static joy. I haven't had such an adrenaline rush since my first day. <laughs> Get me on to the next slide. <laughs> it's Groundhog Day. Can, can you hit page down? Temple one at 10 kilometers a second, 6.3 miles per second, or 23,000 miles an hour, with a 800 pound impactor, 220 pounds of which were pure copper. All right. Wow. Scene analysis on both the flyby and the impactor. We're looking for an illuminated, illuminated place on the comet that was fairly smooth and it ended up hitting right between these two craters. Okay? The comet is rotating down this way, so we got to see, and the, the flyby is down here, so we got to see the creation and the ejecta blowing out for many, many minutes before it rotated out of the uh, field of view. This was the image that we were able to clap. They had to see this image before NASA would let us acknowledge that it was success. So we have an image of the impact from the flyby spacecraft. You 
can see it's blowing out baby powder fine material, which was one of the things the science community did not expect to see. It was so fine it was just baby powder. So you were a little bit beyond the seven seconds of light then? Say that again? So um, I think we've talked about this. Uh, we sent the images back during the approach, you know, as the comet was coming in. We got a lot of great imagery of the impact. And then we flew past and spun back around and actually got more imagery of the comet as it was flying away from us, uh, the, the debris field being generated. The problem with this mission was we created such a huge debris cloud and the material was so baby powder fine that we never did actually get to see the, the crater that we created. The, the material peaked, the, the brightness of the material coming out peaked five days after we hit the comet. So that was when the material finally had all blown out five days later. And we were looking for the crater to determine <coughs> how steep are the walls. You know, how, when the crater was created, was it a you know, punch bowl or was it a tube? Like, and that would tell you a lot about the density of the comet. Because of the debris field that was generated, we weren't able to actually see that. OK, uh, analysis, we started you know, registration points to create the, the model of the comet and start looking for what did we find. OK, we found that we got a lot of fantastic images of a comet with much higher resolution than any other image ever taken prior to this mission. A lot of surface features on this comet. Large, smooth surfaces that look like you know, major sections that have just fallen off, scarps, you know, cliffs around uh, certain features, and then impact zones themselves. So even comets get hit by other debris out in space. Um, about three, three miles in diameter, uh, lots of flat areas, layers of you know, evidence of layering of the material. So a lot of good information coming off of that ice. Okay, first time they had ever proven that ice existed on a comet. And what they really found was instead of being a dirty snowball, it was more of a snowy dirt ball. <laughs> In that there's more dirt than ice. Okay. <laughs> see that the, start, the part that is facing the sun heats up. This is where the coma is being formed. And then on the back, where the deep space temperature is on the back side of the, the uh, comet, and that's, we also determined there is ice, water ice on the comet. And then here's the holy grail. So we created a, a model of what we thought we might see in blue. Okay, the blue line represents what the scientists were thinking they might see. They might see some water. They might see some carbon dioxide. They didn't have the same model in here for the carbons and the hydrogens, but the blue line is a model. The, this is red, red on colored one. This line, which one is that? Red. Red. Yeah, that's red, okay. This was a tenth of a second, taken by the flyby, a tenth of a second before the impact. No spectra being shown. Seven tenths of a second after impact, what does our spectrometer tell us? And this is when I said NASA loves their vis images, their visual images for PR because people really can resonate with pretty pictures. But this is where the IR spectrometer tells us, hey, you've got water, you've got carbon dioxide, you've got your carbons, you've got your hydrogen. So the hypothesis of the organic material that could have established an atmosphere and the possibility of life on Earth shows that that material exists from the comet. High organic component to the comet. This was what made our science community extremely happy. Okay. I know I'm just going and going. So. Okay. Are we? Oh, crap. Sorry about that. All right. So we keep going. We took a picture of the 
Earth or the Moon transiting in front of the Earth. First time that ever picture was ever taken. We survived flying through the tail, so Temple One's still going. Took a picture. This is a movie. Look at it uh, on. Uh, you can do it on the internet. It's a movie of the Earth moving in front of or the Moon moving in front of the Earth. Then we went to another comet, Comet Hartley Two. Use your favorite analogy. That to me looks like a chicken leg. I've heard uh, both of them. Hotly. Yeah. But the interesting thing here is Hartley and Borelli are very similar shape. <laughs> very interesting. Other, these are the best images that NASA has of comets. And now we've been repositioned once again to go after an asteroid, to do another near flyby of asteroid 2002 GT. We did it, we did the maneuver in 2011 for a planned encounter on 2020. So I'll be back here in 2021. <laughs> now, this is my final slide. If you cross your eyes and put these two white dots together, this becomes a 3D image. The Stardust mission flew by Comet Temple 1 in 2011 on Valentine's Day, which is how I spent my Valentine's Day last year with my wife. She was so happy. <laughs> now, they don't have a high resolution camera on Stardust, but there is a faint crater Keep in mind, this is three and a half miles across. There is a crater here. The, the, some of the images you can see faintly, but they do believe it's about 150 meters in diameter and about 30 meters deep, with a sombrero shape in that all of the, a lot of the ejecta came back in and landed back into the center of the crater. So it looks like a, a sombrero. Okay, I apologize for running so late. There is a book about this mission out there if you ever want to read more about it, Jars of Stars. Uh, this, this guy was a daily camera reporter who was so enthralled by the, uh, the story, he literally quit his job at the camera to write a book. I don't recommend you do that. <laughs> space books aren't huge sellers. Thanks to JPL, University of Maryland, and all the folks at Ball. And there are a few copies of Comet Collision. It, sh it shows on the Discovery HD. Every once in a while these days. Okay, I'm sorry to everyone late. <laughs> Thank you. And it appears to be dark outside. <laughs> so, you said you are available to take questions. Those that want to stay and ask all the questions to your heart's content are all going to go stand or have at it. Tell us folks up and running upstairs. So how many people can go up at a time? We get comfortably 15 to 20.
How do we stop that? Yeah. Thank you. 